Psalm 19, the Word of God tells us that the law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. With these truths in mind, let us listen to the law of God as we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, that showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant, or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So far, the law of God, let us now sing in response from Psalm 141, steps 1, 2, 3, and 7.
Let's join together and call upon the name of the Lord. Almighty, gracious God and Father, you are our God, and we are your people, the sheep of your pasture, the flock which you have gathered by the voice of the Good Shepherd, your Son, and who is both God and man, sent to this world to save the lost, to deliver sinners from their bondage to sin, and to achieve the victory over our ancient enemy, the devil, and over all that is evil, and over all that is broken, and all that is subject to misery, over death, and over hell, and over the grave. Father, we thank you for what you have accomplished through the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed on the cross, in which you have shown us your love, your favor, your forgiving grace, and your unfailing faithfulness to do all that you have promised. Father, we thank you that you have grafted into your church all who believe and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that we may share in his victory which he has obtained. But we thank you for the freedom that we have in Christ, that as the children of God, we could walk before you with a clean conscience. We thank you for every good work, every good thought, every good desire and intention that you worked in us by the mighty power of your grace and spirit. And also at the same time, we recognize and confess that we have not always served you with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength, nor have we loved our neighbor as ourselves and treated them as we would like others to treat us. Or forgive us for the sins we've committed. Forgive us for returning to old slave masters from which you have set us free. Forgive us in Christ your Son. And help us to resist the temptations that the devil presents. That we would see through his deceitfulness. That we would resist conforming to the world the evil desires of our own flesh. Instead, O Lord, continue your good work in us to sanctify us, to make us holy through your word and spirit, that our love for sin and doing our own will would decrease, would dissolve, would disappear, and that our love for righteousness and doing your will would grow and increase. Father, to that end, Bless us as we open your word this morning. Bless us in the reading and the hearing of it, that our faith may be strengthened and increased through this means that you have appointed, that we would be changed by the truth that comes to us in power and in grace. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, where we will read from one portion, a small portion of Matthew chapter 12. We'll read from verse 33 to 37. Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 33. Hear now God's holy and infallible word from Lord Jesus Christ, who's speaking and teaching at this with these words, saying, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good? When you are evil, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. So far, the reading of God's word, let 
us sing in response from Psalm 73, Senses 1, 4, and 6. Turn now to our text that is found in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Come to Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 to 18 for the text for the sermon this morning. This is the second to last passage that we will look at in this book to the final words next week. We come now to the final disputation here, the final dispute that the Lord has with his people, beginning at Malachi 3, verse 13, where he says, Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, How have we spoken against you? You have said, It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping this charge, or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evil doers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention. 
region and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who fear the Lord and esteem his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So far, the reading of our text. Well, the congregation, as we come now here to the end of chapter 3 of the book of Malachi, and also with a view toward what is on the horizon in chapter 4, the book of Malachi has come to its final dispute, its sixth and final dispute that God raises with his people. And it circles back to the central theme, the grand theme of this book in greater detail which is a focus on the day of the Lord. Be ready for that day. It's really the, the overarching theme of this book. And that's the final note then that this book and the whole Old Testament comes to a close with. The day of the Lord being that day when Christ would certainly come. We've heard this prophecy already in this book. Clearly stated in the first words of chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of my covenant in whom I delight. Behold, I am coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming? We saw a few weeks ago that that is a prophecy of none other than the coming of Christ, heralded by John the Baptist, who would come before. So Christ is coming on a great and noble day. Noble in the sense that he is, we can know that he's coming. And that, in a nutshell, is, is the drumbeat of the whole Old Testament. And that's the prophecy that Malachi wanted the people to know and remember in the midst of their circumstances. When this seemed so far away. And this was the answer to the question that the Israelites were asking at the end of chapter 2, verse 17. Where is the God of justice? The answer is, He is coming. Now, it's necessary to clarify when speaking of the day of the Lord that, that this is a, a broad idea. And so the classic illustration that's often used to explain how the prophets looked at and how they interpreted such things in the Bible is to think of it as, as though you are driving up to some mountains on a clear day, and you see mountains, and you see mountains behind the mountains, and you see sometimes mountains behind those mountains. But if you're far enough away, it all looks like one range. When you get into those mountains, and you find out otherwise that there are various mountains here. And that's how it is with the Old Testament prophets when they're speaking about Christ's coming. They were seeing the whole of it, the whole range from his birth to his second coming, all and all that was in between, the entirety of his ministry, even as it extended to his exaltation and his enthronement into heaven upon his ascension. But when you get into the New Covenant, when you get into those mountains, it becomes evident that there is a very clear division between Christ's first coming and his second coming. And that second coming is particularly concentrated on the final judgment. And that judgment is very much in view by Malachi here. That's quite clear from the beginning of chapter 4. If we had read on, we would have read, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall so set them away, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out in triumph, in essence. 
So it is clear that Christ is coming. He's coming to judge the world. At the end of all things, there's going to be a great accounting. And God will mark the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus spoke of them as the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25. So there's this judgment that is spoken of throughout the Old Testament, exercised by the Lord, and the Bible ends with this theme as well in the book of Revelation. And even before that, in Acts 17, when Paul preaches in Athens to the Gentiles concerning the unknown God, whom he declared to be the true God, he said, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So part and parcel of the gospel message is that at the end of the age there will be a judgment, a separation of the righteous and the wicked. And the critical question that comes to us that we can we will explore from our text this morning in Malachi three is what criteria will God use in making this judgment? On what basis, on what will be the basis of his judgment? For God knows our lives, and he knows our hearts inside and out. He's fully known to him, he is all knowing. And he pays attention to everything that happens. But one thing that the Bible repeatedly emphasizes will be the criterion for judgment is our words. Our words. It's a very simple thing. What you say will be one of the key telling factors that the Lord will use when he considers his judgment. So as we give thought to this context and this coming day, we look at our text this morning under the following theme, those who fear the Lord order their speech accordingly, and we'll consider first speech that is condemned, and secondly speech that is commended, first the negative and the positive. As mentioned, what we have in Malachi 3, and verse 13, is the last disputation of this book. And it's about words. You see, your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? The accusation is hard words, harsh words. That's God's charge against his people. And Israel, again, as usual, according to their customary pattern throughout this book, Responds with, How? We know nothing, we see nothing of the sort. In what way have we spoken against you? What have we said? And so the Lord then again gives evidence. Verse 14 You have said it was their words that were against God. How were they against God? They were saying that it was vain to serve God. It was useless, in other words, to them. Futile. What is the profit of our keeping his charge? What use was it to live according to God's will in any of these things pertaining to worshiping God rightly, as he commanded in his law? What use was it to live lives of purity and good order? They didn't see any profit in walking in God's ways or in walking as mourners before the Lord. It's hard to know why they were mourning here, but we know that that their condition as a nation was in poor shape as they were oppressed, as they didn't have their king on the throne. They didn't really even possess their own land legally, but but were a vassal state service and subject to Persians. Those could certainly be reasons for why they were grieving and mourning. It could also be that their mourning was evidence of contrition, of a contract heart, of repentance for their sin. 
even though it was in, back in chapter 2, verse 13, it was noted that their tears were not always a, a true sign, not always a true indication of repentance. It could also be false contrition. It was only for show. But whether or not the morning was genuine, the people are asking, what use is there in being contrite and sorry for our sins? What use is there in being devoted to God's will? Since our situation really isn't improving as a result, so far as we can see, why even continue to, to try to do all the right things if this is what we get in return? So to sum it up in one phrase, they were saying it's useless to serve God. And these words are some very dangerous words. But what was at the root of these words? The people were saying this because they thought that they saw some injustice on God's part. It's a familiar complaint for the people of God throughout the ages to, to fall into the temptation to compare oneself with the world around you and then think that it's a futile effort, a futile exercise to, to serve God. We saw that in Psalm 73 that we saw earlier. Asaph, the author of Psalm 73, confesses that he was envious of the arrogant when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. But from what he observed, nothing happened to the wicked who would simply carry on in their wicked ways, who always seemed to be at ease. And so he says, All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. What does it pay to serve God? What use is obedience, especially when this obedience requires self-denial and self-sacrifice and repentance and seeking forgiveness and self-control when none of it seems to pay, to pay off. And it just seems to make life harder and more difficult. That's very much the same thought being expressed in Malachi 3, verse 15. We call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. In other words, the people were charging God with being unjust, being uh, not being fair. That's the argument. There was a deep-rooted way of thinking where they concluded that all that they were doing was all for nothing. The sacrifices were not worth the reward. But what's the problem when, when someone thinks this way? What's the problem? Well, number one, it's short-sighted. It's short-sighted. It doesn't take a long view. It doesn't keep that in mind. And it underestimates what God has promised to give to those who are obedient. And so it turns the religious life into a, a bargaining session with God. If I do this, then God owes me that. If I do this for him, then he gives me a reward. We misunderstand God. We misunderstand His character in, the, in such a way. They say, but I don't get it. Then, then I throw up my arms and I say, it's useless. There's no profit in living this way. If God does not give me what, what I believe I deserve for living the way He told me, then, then this is a raw deal. But is this the way that religion works? No, it's not. For God is holy and sovereign and majestic and far beyond our ability to comprehend and to know. He is sovereign over all things. He is infinitely greater than we are. His character cannot be questioned. His ways are above our ways. And because He, by His grace, has promised salvation and provided salvation in Christ, then when He owes us, when He owed us nothing, Therefore, we owe him everything. That's the way that it works. This is what was lost on the Israelites and what, in what they were saying in the first part of our text. 
Amalekai uses this particular dispute to highlight a contrast, the difference between those who know God, but, but, those, who, for those who don't know God and those who fear Him. The difference between those who don't know God and those who fear Him. The difference spelled out clearly in verse 18. There's a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve Him. And again, the criteria that the text sets forth is, is what one says about God, how you talk about it. There were those who were grumbling, those who were murmuring, just like the people of Israel had done in the wilderness. When everything got difficult, whenever life got tough, they cried out to Moses to even bring them back to Egypt, where they said life had been so much better. They were, they were seeing the evildoers prosper and put God to the test and yet go free. And this made them angry and upset and complain. And this was their contention then with God that they raised. They believed that God had not seen or heard. And all of this put his justice into question. Now notice the emphasis on speech here. The emphasis on speech, words. In Malachi, all of the disputations between God and Israel are what they said about him. Those words, you say, you say, you say, they keep coming back time and time again. Back in chapter 2, verse 17, it was explicitly stated, you have wearied the Lord with your words. You've wearied him with your words. It's interesting that God's overarching indictment of his people in this book centers on their complaining words. Of course, it also extends to their actions, but the sins of the tongue are a very real sin that God addresses in this book, but he also addresses even with us today. The sins of the tongue are nothing to ignore because God does not ignore them. He does not ignore other people that openly and defiantly question His goodness and His grace. In the midst of their hardship, in the midst of their testing. So this is the type of speech that God condemns in our text this morning. He speaks out against it. And it brings us to verse 16 where we find a different kind of speech on display. The kind of speech that God commends. So we come to our second point. In verse 16, we come to a contrast between those who were speaking in, in verses 13 to 15 to now consider those whom our text identifies as those who feared the Lord, those who honored God with their words. Verse 16, that those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. Again, we have people here who are talking, and again, God is listening. But this group is very, very different, and their speaking is very different. The picture is of a, a group of believers who are speaking together, and God is in heaven listening to them. For He knows everything, He sees everything, and He hears everything, as Psalm 139 says. Before a word is on our tongue, he knows it completely. Well then, how much so also when that word, those words are off our tongue? And we get a clear sense of what the Lord's reaction is to hearing this different conversation than the one that was mentioned in the first point. He takes delight in this. The Lord paid attention. And he heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who fear the Lord and esteem his name. This, this type of speech clearly pleases God because he takes note of it. He writes it down in his book of remembrance. Well, what does that mean exactly, this book of remembrance? Well, you may have. You might hear echoes here to the, the book of Esther. 
book of Esther, after Mordecai hears the plot to kill the king, his deeds are written down in a book of, rem- of remembrance, so a book of the more memorable deeds, the Chronicles of the King, which is a record that, of course, features greatly in the story, as you know, where it is later, that book is later brought to the king's awareness, and he exalts Mordecai as a result. Now, God has a book of remembrance. This doesn't mean in the same way a literal book that he keeps. And God doesn't ever forget anything. He doesn't need a book to make notes to remember, however much they may, may benefit us to do so. But the illustration here is given in language to help us understand how God thinks of his people and how he knows everything and how he hears every conversation and how he, he creates a record of this on, on a cosmic level in which, which he will review and also upon which he will issue rewards. Now, what is this book of remembrance record? It records our conversations about God. It records what we tell about what he has done for us, for our souls, how we exhort one another to faith and godliness, starting in our own families and friends, and no doubt extending also to the church. As Hebrews 10, verse 24, 25 puts it, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, the connection between speaking and the day of the Lord approaching, in light of the day of the Lord approaching, believers talk with one another about what God has done and is doing for us and will do for us. And God hears and it pleases Him. Why? Because it is evidence of a different heart, a renewed heart. And what was, what was it in their heart that was so different? It was, as our text mentions twice, they feared the Lord. They feared the Lord. So this second group held before us in our text are those who, who don't preoccupy themselves with lesser important matters. That they dwell on God and they, they speak good things about their God. Now, the first group, group that we saw earlier, the first group was outwardly religious. But the second group is inwardly religious in their hearts, having awe for God and for His holiness and for His love and for His goodness and, and, and respect and honor Him for it. They exhibit the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. This fear of the Lord again is not terror, fright, but reverence and honor and love. The true Christian is marked by this fear, this devotion to God, not for what he gives, not for what, what we get in return. We, we fear God for who he is. And, and the fruit of a heart that is kept, captivated by this is seen, and as our Lord Jesus says, what flows out of the mouth in terms of godly conversation with one another. And God hears this from heaven, and he writes this in his book of remembrance of those who fear him and esteem his name. And even more than that, verse 17, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasure possession. The wonderful thing is this same day, this day of judgment, when God will draw these to himself and he will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. The evidence, the evidence of this eternal destination is 
in their godly conversation. This is something that the wisdom literature in the Bible, the wisdom literature, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, they speak much about this aspect of the Christian life. There's much to learn about the tongue and how to be careful with the tongue. The book of James as well, we can add, has some powerful things to say upon, uh, on, on the tongue, about the tongue. There's much direction and great motivation for us to use our tongues for the glory of God. Well, how does the Bible speak to this? Well, for example, the Bible says in, in Ecclesiastes 5 that the first thing about speaking wisely is to not speak too much and not speak too quickly. It says, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. It's a good thing. And it compares with Malachi 3. They're, they're talking, they're speaking, clearly spreading from, from their meditation upon the Lord and what he had done to make a name for himself. And this no doubt requires that, that we be careful in how we use our tongue. Realizing that it is a restless evil full of deadly poison, as James says. And so it's very easy to use it wrongly. We know this. Young and old, we ought to, we ought to be careful not to use foul language, of course. But neither are we to fall into bad habits. That, that become harder and harder to break, harder and harder to, to root out, harder and harder to change, harder and harder to, to put off. So we are to be careful also then in what we take in, what we drink in, because what we meditate upon will, will come out of us. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you don't spend much time thinking about the Lord or His Word, then it would not be surprising if you never talk about it. This goes hand in hand. If, it, if the only thing we ever think about is sports or whatever you're consumed with day by day, the daily things of this life, then, then they will consume you. If you're consumed by them, they will consume you and they will be your chosen topic for conversation. But the Bible says that the things of this world are passing away. If we are here today and gone tomorrow, so you need to feed on the best things. You need to feed on Christ and the things of eternity. And then your conversations will change accordingly. And this text then calls us to use our words especially to build up other Christians. They spoke with one another, as the text says. Paul uses similar language when he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 1 Thessalonians 5 Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. In Hebrews 3, verse 13, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Well, it's just a flurry of passages that give us a picture that, that there is this stream of, of godly conversation that, that comes out of hearts that are filled with the Spirit of God, and they give glory to God, and they build up the neighbor. So we should, of course, then take care, brothers and sisters, take care to avoid doing harm with our words or speaking to someone's disadvantage, but instead take care to do good, take care to bless, take care to build up, to encourage the show appreciation with the words that, that we speak to and about what about others. Well, what better goal could there be, brothers and sisters? What better goal could there be 
than to speak with the intention of leaving the other person better off as a result of our conversation after it is done. Take to heart the comfort that's packed into verse 17 in the last phrase. They shall be mine, says the Lord, in the day that I make of my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Well, last statement there reminds us of Romans 8, that God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. God says, I will, I will give you the reward. The reward is coming, the reward of a faithful son, and you will be my treasure. Well, that answers the question, doesn't it? What does it profit a man to, to fear the Lord and to honor him? Well, the prophet is that God not only stoops down to listen to him or to her, to that kind of speech, but he delights in such words, he delights in such a life, he delights in such a service to him. And on the day of Christ, the day of Christ comes to judge, he will not only approve of it, but he will also reward it. And this is all the gift of his grace. This reward is not earned. It is the gift of God's grace. This grace of God is revealed in transformed speech. This is how Malachi teaches us to discern between the righteous and the wicked, which will be made evident more clearly, most clearly, on the coming day of Christ's return. So may this that also be evident in us today that our lips produce the fruit that is pleasing to God, so that in everything we would bring Him glory. Amen. Let us sing in response to God's word from Psalm 19, stanzas 4 and 6.
congregational prayer this morning. We will remember in particular John Hudema, John Hudema, the brother of our sister Kobe Beltman, whose cancer has been progressing and spreading. And he's gone from hospital care to palliative care at home. So we will remember him in the family prayer. Lord, our God, we pray that you would sanctify our lips, that you would sanctify our words. We pray for that deeper sanctifying work that you promised and that you are pleased to do in us to cause us to grow in the fear of your name. Lord, we pray that the love that you have shown us would also be evident in our speech with one another, and especially in our talking about you, that our conversations would be God-centered, that they would be spiritually minded. Lord, we pray that as a church and as a congregation, we would speak with eternal things in view, that we would have no greater delight than to speak of the goodness that you have shown to us and the goodness that you have promised to us. So we pray that our tongues would be tamed by your Spirit, that they would be used for your glory. And as we think of all the ways that we have failed to do so, we pray that you would grant us forgiveness, that you would grant us a sense of hope and comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was not spared, so that we could be forgiven for the sins of our tongues, that we would, could learn to fear you rightly. Father, we thank you for your good and gracious care over us through this past week. Lord, your care has been evident in so many ways, in more ways than we can number. Lord, you bless us so richly, and yet our memories can be so short. So, Lord, we thank you for providing for us all the necessities of life, all that we needed to serve you and our neighbor in this world. Lord, you provided our daily bread and so much more. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of strength and of good health to do our work and to fulfill our callings. We thank you for sustaining us each day, even in tough days and even in the challenges that we face. And Lord, we pray that you will be near to those who are experiencing adversity in whatever way. We pray especially that you will provide for our sister Kobe Veltman as her brother John suffers declining health due to illness. Lord, we thank you that he can return home from the hospital and that he is receiving the care there that he needs at home. Lord, we pray that you will keep him and all of his loved ones in your care, that you would bless the time that you give them together, and that you will enable him to rest strong and firm in his faith and in the hope of the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ, and that he may know, still in these days, your unfailing love and care. Lord, we thank you for all the good gifts that you've given to us. We thank you for all the members who are celebrating their birthdays this week. Lord, we thank you for Lauren Elmore, for Shanna Barron's, for Raymond Dragon Hill, and Al Seitzma. Lord, continue to show your goodness and faithfulness and love to each of them and guide them and keep them also in the year to come. Father, we thank you for all that you've provided for us, to us as a congregation. We pray that you will continue to enable us also to support the ministry of the Word and support Christian education and support Christian charity, that each of these endeavors would be blessed with success and they would yield good fruit for your glory and for your kingdom. Lord, we pray that our communities, too, that surround us here at Sumas, Dubsack, and Everson, would come to a knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that you would use our efforts, that you would hear our prayers, that you would work by ways of outreach and witness as a means to that end. Lord, we lift up our prayer to you with thankfulness for your love and for your mercy in Jesus Christ, and we ask you to hear us in his name. 
Amen. The Lord now gives you the opportunity to worship Him through the giving of your gifts as the Thanksgiving offering is collected by the deacons for the ministry of mercy. And thereafter, we'll sing together from Psalm 139, sections 1, 2, and 13.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.